The Reach of Andrew Tate. I've explained in parts passim that Andrew Tate is a lesser narcissist, upper lesser type B somatic. That he doesn't operate with a facade in terms of being kind or being empathic, but rather he revels in the image of being an uncaring, unflinching, telling you straight individual. He's bombastic, he brags, he's belligerent. He has no emotional empathy. He engages in what are obvious behaviours that show that absence of emotional empathy, and it doesn't concern him that that's the case. If you were to point it out to him, he would go, so what? I'm right, you're wrong. The bitch has asked for it. Men need to grow a pair and reclaim the centre ground, not politically, but in terms of domination. He makes no apologies for who he is. If you call him a misogynist, he says, if that's what you think that I am, then so be it. He doesn't give a rat's ass in terms of it being viewed critically. Indeed, he revels in it and is productive in that regard. But he also has something of a reach. Even though he was banned from certain social media platforms, although he has returned to Twitter as of late, he was still appearing regularly as a consequence of other people putting up videos including him. And thus, his notoriety increased. He's also managed to persuade a number of people, in running into over 100,000, to part with money to join his so-called Hustlers University. Now, he may not be as wealthy as he portrays, indeed, as an upper lesser type B. There's bound to be some bullshit in that regard. But there is a degree of success there that is evident. He'll exaggerate it. Of course he does. He's an upper lesser. It's his nature to maximise what he has, to boast about it, and to make it seem even more than it actually is. But nevertheless, there is a foundation of success there. That's by virtue of being, and which is why he's part of, part of the reason why he is categorised as upper lesser. But it's also interesting because upper lessers have a reasonably decent reach as well. So, let's dive into a couple of articles that talk about the influencer and his impact upon other people. First of all, there's an article in the Times from Hugo Rifkin. I'm not sorry for interviewing the misogynist Andrew Tate. The influencer's vile opinions brought him fame without scrutiny, so to try to shine a light on him cannot be wrong. So yes, I've been there. The horrible compound in Romania, with its screens on the walls, supercars in the yard and guns on the coffee table, where the British misogynist influencer Andrew Tate was arrested last week on charges relating to human trafficking and rape. Alleged criminality, supercars, triangulation with object and grandiosity, Guns, triangulation with object. Rifkin writes, I went in September. The allegations are that he was part of a gang who lured women there by means of online seduction, before holding them against their will to work on pornographic webcams. He lured me, though, by agreeing to an interview for the Times magazine. And at this point, we're going to go back to that interview that took place last September because it tells us more about the behaviours of Tate and then we'll return to the observations that Rifkin has to make now having been there and knowing more about what has gone on. So back in September Rifkin wrote the king of toxic masculinity welcomes me into his compound in a suburb on the outskirts of Bucharest and offers me a cigar bribery. His name is Andrew Tate, and who's once on Big Brother. For a while, although not because of that, he may have been the most famous man in the world. We'll get to that. For now, just be aware that there's an axe, a sword, and a couple of knives on the coffee table, triangulation by object, intimidation, and a bunch of supercars in the yard. I recognise a Rolls Royce, but otherwise cars aren't really my thing. Deeper inside his wood panel cigar room, there's a safe the size of a fridge full of cash. Grandiosity, triangulation by object. Watches and gold. Grandiosity, showmanship, triangulation by object. And a huge CCTV screen on the wall, on which he points out the armed guards dotted around the property. 
They are allowed to carry weapons, he explains, because his home is registered with the Romanian authorities as a shooting range. That's one reason he doesn't live in the United Kingdom, so his bodyguards can have guns. Manifestation of paranoia. Now, look, I know what you are thinking. How can this be the most famous man in the world if you've never heard of him? It's a fair question, and ten days earlier, I'd hardly heard of him either. The thing is, lots of people had. I'm the most Googled man on the planet, he said in January, showmanship. I'm more Googled than Joe Biden, Donald Trump. Look it up. He says it to me several times. Repetition, showmanship, grandiosity. Granted, there is much Tate says that should be taken with a pinch of salt. He also claimed to be the world's first trillionaire. But he may have been right. That's likely to be incorrect. Bullshit, grandiosity, exaggeration. Last month, though, he was banned from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and TikTok. Not long before that, hope not hate, the activist group had declared, our major concern is that his brand of extreme and sometimes violent misogyny is reaching a young male audience and that he could serve as a gateway to wider far-right politics. Was this fair or was it not? That's what I've come to Romania to find out. I'm telling you, Tate says, I never thought I'd become the most famous man in the world by saying women make me a coffee. Let's be honest, it's not just about coffee. There are scores of Andrew Tate clips still floating around, even on the platforms for which he has been banned. Bang out the machete, boom in her face and grip her by the neck. Shut up, bitch, he says in one. Application of violence, assertion of control. In another he says, slap, slap, grab, choke, shut up, bitch, sex. Can hardly string a sentence together, it would appear. But also, this is demonstrative of a lack of emotional empathy with regard to the manner in which he's talking about women. That was about me sleeping with a machete next to my bed, he says now. I'm a security-conscious individual. And what happened, he says, was that a girl picked up the machete and told him she'd chop his head off if he cheated. So he told her what he'd do to stop her. Nullification of threat to control. And she laughed out loud, he says. You're so funny, give me a kiss. So that was a joke. The problem, says Tate, is that these things will all turn up as tiny clips from longer videos and are never considered in context. Our coffee discussion, for example, is sparked by me reading him another widely reported quote in which he says a woman should have kids sit at home, be quiet and make coffee, which he insists he simply never said. Denial. Although, for the record, he has also definitely said that he'll ask a woman to bring him two coffees and then drink only one because it's doing something that is basically pointless to show that you have respect for me. Grandiosity, assertion of control, which I have not tried at home. There's also another video we should mention that. It's the one that got him kicked out of Big Brother in 2016 after it appeared in the Daily Star. In it, he slaps a blonde girl in the face. You hear it. It's definitely a slap and then beats her with a belt. Application of physical violence, assertion of control, absence of emotional empathy. I watch it before I meet him. Then, after I get back to my hotel, after two hours in which we frankly got on pretty well, I make myself watch it again. Tate says now that it was a consensual sex game. And it's true that the woman involved has released a video in which she says the same. He also points out quite vehemently that the lefty liberals, who hate him so much, also usually say it's wrong to kink shame people for their sexual preferences. I must be the wrong sort of lefty liberal, though, because I think it's fucking gross. Tate's favour was Emery Tate, a trailblazing black chess player. Tate Sr. had a playing style that focused on attacking, never defending, which is a detail worth remembering. His mother Eileen was largely a housewife. Tate Jr. started life in Chicago, Illinois, before moving as a child to a council estate in Luton, or, as he puts it, the worst town in the UK. His voice is a mess. Think Lloyd Grossman, but furious. Ouch. They were together, he says of his parents, but my father was in the Air Force. He was away for long periods of time. That potentially could have created a lack of control environment. And he was away at chess tournaments for long periods of time. And he'd come home and say, look, your mother has to do the day-to-day -day stuff. I'm a man. I have to make sure you're protected. And we'd sit and we'd play chess. Tate describes himself as a chess prodigy, showcasing. But he also says he wasn't quite good enough. Instead, he got into kickboxing. Four times he was the International Sport Karate Association's world champion. After that, though, he went into porn. Not as a performer. Instead, he and his brother Tristan set up an agency through which they managed webcam performers, women who perform sex acts on camera. Each girl, he says now, would usually keep 80 to 85% of the money. 
money paid by online punters who wanted them to do this or that. Most of the girls that work for me ended up being multimillionaires, he says, now, although I'm I ask him to give me a name to put me in touch with just one of these happy, happy porn actresses who are now millionaires, and he grows coy. Likely, therefore, that this is a revision of history and a lie. They're not interested in speaking to the press, he says. They've moved on. They've dyed their hair. They're married. Strikes me as deflection. He talks about it like an anodyne business venture. In the past, though, he's quipped on camera about the big hassle of how much sex it forced him to have. I'd wake up, he said a few months ago, and I'd be like, seven of these bitches have done well. I have to fuck seven of these girls in the next three hours. I can't fuck one because the other six will get upset. I can't fuck none because they'll all get upset and don't work. I've got to fuck all seven and I've got three hours. Damn. Grandiosity. Although the important part, he says now, is that none of them have ever accused him of wrongdoing. It truly is amazing, he says, that people have tried very hard to dig and find a woman with something bad to say about me, and they can't find a single one. Image of invincibility. What I sense, though, is that none of this is quite explaining to you how Andrew Tate became the most famous man in the world. I would say there are two answers to that question, and one of them is a bit technical, so let's deal with the other one first. Tate is famous because he's brilliant at what he does. I don't mean he's nice. He's definitely not nice. He's famous because he talks with an addictive, terrifying fluency perfected, perfectly suited to the internet age. Like Donald Trump, with whom there are all sorts of similarities. Note also that Trump's in a lesser type B. Actually, he's compulsive when you agree with him, but equally compulsive when you do not. On his own videos and on the podcasts of others, he tells his life story and offers his views on how men and women should behave. Prescriptive behaviours, ordering around, sense of entitlement. Mostly he talks about success, how to become as rich as he is, and as strong as he is, how to have sex with as many women as he apparently does. There's a temptation simply to ridicule this, but you cannot deny the extent to which it connects. There are, bluntly, a lot of young men out there who do not know what to be. What Tate does is answer that question, and you might not like his answer, but at least he has one. The other reason Tate is so famous is that he set out to be ambition. When we speak, at least at first, he insists that his banning is due to his critics clipping his videos out of context and that he's been hard done by. Victim mentality, paranoia, pity play. This, though, is just not true. Both of those clips up above were circulated not by his critics, but clearly by his fans. What's more, they obviously thought they had his blessing. Until recently, you see, he was running a business called Hustlers University, which ostensibly offered online business advice, but which also paid subscribers almost half the money generated from any new subscribers they went on to lure in. Some called it a pyramid scheme. He said those allegations were false denial, but it also made his clips and content spread around the internet like a rash. What you really want is a mix of 60 to 70% fans and 30 to 40% haters, he said in one Hustlers video. You want arguments, you want war. Basically, he was a virus. Can you give me an example of a specific misogynistic thing I said, says Tate, leaning over the table in his cigar room. I have some up my sleeve, but we don't get far. Tate, you see, does not believe himself to be a misogynist. Denial. Yes, he thinks that a man's job is to defend and provide for a woman, and that a woman's job is to look after her man. Yes, he also thinks that a woman must be faithful, and that a man, or at least a man like him, there's nuance here, need not be. Sense of entitlement. Also, he thinks women are most attractive about the age of 19 because at that stage, and this is a direct quote, although not to me, they've been through less dick. But what he disputes quite furiously is that any of this is misogynistic. In fact, he says, I only think this because I'm an out-of-touch liberal. I'm not a misogynistic person, he says. I'm a traditional person. Hang on. I'm a married man who lives in a terraced house with two kids. He's a poor millionaire with numerous girlfriends who lives in a fortified Romanian compound, and he's the traditional one? Since the dawn of time, says Tate, every king, every sultan, every emperor had more than one wife, or had a wife and had a mistress. Powerful men have a certain status. Since the dawn of time, not every man can say this. You interview a rapper, and you won't question him in the same way. His argument, you'll understand, is that it's not like this for all men. The guy working in Starbucks? No sleeping around for him. These rules are only for high-status men, like Tate. Grandiosity. If you are a high-enough-status male, he says, and I'm talking from experience, women do not expect loyalty from you like they would from a lower-status male. This has been proved. Am I also a high-status male? I ask. Tate thinks not. Right, I say. Why? Because society's taken a turn for worse, he says. We live in a world where status is heavily derived from attention. To an extent, Tate is right about this. But I have 200,000 Twitter followers, I say. I have a radio show. Does that count? 
Oh, okay, he says, sounding genuinely respectful. Then perhaps you are. Although then he points out that if I were to meet a 19-year-old Belarusian beauty queen in Dubai, she might not think so, which I think is fair. The thing is, I say carefully, I'm 45, so I'm not sure that having a 19-year-old Belarusian girlfriend would actually be high-status behaviour. In fact, I think it would be pretty low-status, shitty behaviour. Tate shrugs. You're trying to apply your worldview, he says, and it's quite disrespectful, not to me, but to the world. If you were in Dubai and you were a billionaire and you had a yacht, you would need the 19-year-old to be high status. It's a different game. Here, Tate is demonstrating that he looks at the world through an alternative perspective. Later on, he tells me that the difference between us is that he believes women are sovereign individuals who can make their own choices, and he just doesn't think I believe the same. So maybe I'm the misogynist here. Who knows? The Romania thing, though, that's weird. He's not from here. He barely speaks Romanian, and yet here he is in his converted warehouse that looks like a car showroom somewhere on the outskirts of Bucharest. And as much as I can tell, we're nowhere special at all. The road outside is pitted. The flats across the road are just flats. It's a very misunderstood country, he tells me. A lot of people have negative perceptions, which I think is quite xenophobic, quite racist. This is probably true. It's also true, though, that he himself once joked that he was in Romania because it's corrupt, which suits me because I'm fucking rich. He now, in a now deleted, he also, in a now deleted video on his YouTube channel, suggested that part of the reason had been the country's sex laws. I'm not a fucking rapist, but I like the idea of being able to do what I want. Sense of entitlement, lack of accountability, was how he put it. What he meant by this was, he says now, is that he sees Romania as immune to what he perceives as a Western sickness of excessive legalism. A dying empire adopts laws, he says, like a sick man adopts medicine. Probably, though, I should point out that in April this compound, right where I'm sitting, was raided by Romanian police as part of a human trafficking investigation. Tate's version of this is that he was swatted, an internet term for your enemies lying, so that armed police will be sent to your home. No charges have been brought. It also seems to be a safety thing. Bucharest is 20 to 30 times safer than London, he tells me. This is not true, although armed robbery is about three times more common in London, and that's presumably what he's worried about. While Tate does seem to have picked up that weird Trumpist American notion of the UK being a hellhole, I wear a $1 million watch, I drive a $5 million car, you can't do any of that in London anymore, he says, grandiosity, triangulation with objects, I suppose he would make for an attractive target for some Guy Ritchie film-style gang. Even allowing for that, though, there is a streak of weird filthiness here. The CCTV in his house, like I mentioned, is particularly insane paranoia. Even inside, there are cameras everywhere except the toilets and bedrooms. Although he's cagey about it, there is family in the picture too. His brother Tristan lives here, same idea, more hair, and he has a daughter. Other people, girls, kids and baby mamas, as he puts it, come and go. Tate has children himself but won't talk about them. I'm not going to give numbers, he says, but I am certain I'll have more children than 99.9% .9 of the population of the Western world, double-digit children, and they all adore me. They see me as their hero, and the women who have my children see me as a hero. Everyone chooses. Everyone close to me respects me. Nobody's ever said that what I'm doing is detrimental to the boys or the girls. The trillionaire thing, I say later. Come on, what currency are we talking here? Zimbabwean, he grins. Zimbabwe, bro. He now says that this was a joke, although I've seen the video where he said it and it doesn't sound like a joke. It sounds like a mad lie. Revision of history. Lie. Actually, it's quite hard to figure out how much money there really is here. He insists that Hustlers University was never his main income stream, but he won't tell me what is. I have various income streams, he says, substantial, which I'm not prepared to disclose. I don't think any high, ultra-high net worth individual is going to sit with a reporter and tell him how he makes money. But roughly, I say. I'm an influencer, he says. I'm heavily into property. I have some media contacts. Some reports suggest casinos. With my unpracticed eye, I'd say there has to be a few million here, or else he couldn't live as he does. There are a couple of million in cars out the front, and there's probably another couple of million in the safe. At the same time, though, we're not talking yacht money. We're not tax dodging in Monaco, after all, or on some private island. We're in a big breeze block barn outside Bucharest. Let's keep it in perspective. And that level of wealth is commensurate with the usual upper lesser that Tate is. The funny thing is, having spent a couple of hours with Tate, I feel I understand him less well on leaving than I did when I arrived. I was unprepared for how smart he is. Upper lessers are often very clever. It makes everything else not quite make sense. For one thing, there's his obsession with status. Well, that's because it allows him to assert control and draw fuel and is part of his narcissism, something, of course, that the reporter here is not aware of. 
There's his obsession with status, which is not just reductive, but also oddly adolescent. He's 35 years old, and yet he still seems to feel that at the pinnacle of human success, you would not find you would find not a captain of industry or Hollywood star, but a mid-level rapper or gangster. At one point, I also point out that there are levels of status here that we're simply not getting into, such as the way that, for all his women, he's deeply unlikely to date Scarlett Johansson. I think it makes him a bit cross. It's a challenge to his uh, need for control. He has aspirations to philanthropy and tells me he recently paid to rebuild a Roman Romanian orphanage. He also tells me that depressed men email him constantly and he writes back. I've saved thousands of men from depression, he says. I've been fantastic for men's mental health. I have unlimited emails from people saying my son goes to the gym because of you. That Trump thing I mentioned, you can hear it, right? Recently, he says he was emailed by a man who was thinking of killing himself. Tate told him to go to the gym. And if he'd emailed Scarlett Johansson, he says perhaps not having quite understood my point there, he would have been ignored. Obviously, I have no way of judging how much of this is true. It must be said, though, that Tate is at his very best on the plight of failing invisible young men and his advice to them, which is basically earn some money and do some exercise and your life will get better. It's hard to fault. He's particularly good on the demonization of working class men, although he starts properly shouting about that at one point and I think gets a bit carried away. Men like me have a hugely important role in society, he says, which is being removed, destroyed and demonised and decimated. The same people who are telling people like me we shouldn't exist, when the shit really hits the fan, when it's trouble, when it's a war, I suggest weakly. When it's a war, he says, you don't call a fucking feminist, you call Tate. Strictly speaking, I'm just not sure you do. Where I get edgy, though, is with his need to contrast men's lot with women's. There are more invisible men than invisible women, he tells me. Are there, I say? That's been proved, he says, scientifically. Has it, I say. His point is that in a nightclub, almost all women will be able to find someone willing to have sex with them, while many men would not. They are the gatekeepers of the sexual marketplace, he keeps saying, which as well as being creepy as hell, is also just a weird focus, particularly at his age. Why in the end is it all about sex in nightclubs? Why isn't it about jobs? We're not 14 years old. The misogyny also just gets frustrating. You think you could argue about it, but you can't, because when a man fundamentally doesn't recognise a woman as being the same sort of thing as he is, there's actually nowhere to go. Although obviously this is, a, this is more or less what he accuses me of in return when I worry at one point that, for example, a mafia warlord's girlfriend might not wholly be in charge of her own destiny. A question I would like to ask you, he says, is what do you think of all the women who have stood up in defence of me? Do you think they're stupid? It's a fair question, and I'm not sure how to answer it. I know what he thinks of them, though, because he tells me. What I have noticed, he says, is that 100% of the women who have stuck up for me are objectively beautiful. Is that good, I say? I don't know, he says, clearly having not considered that it might not be. Maybe I suggest it's because these are the only women who have a place on planet Tate. It certainly accelerates the hate from less attractive women, he says. This fucking Barbie says he's a good guy, she's hot, I'm fat. I try to explain this isn't quite what I meant. I'm not in control of your calorie intake, or her beauty, he says. I'm just saying. It's an observation I have made. I'm all for tech companies being free to ban whoever they like. What I do think, though, is they should explain precisely why they've done it. With Tate, they haven't, either to him or in public, and the danger is that people will think it's about his politics. Certainly, he's on the right. Hope Not Hate has highlighted his defence of the English Defence League's Tommy Robinson. He clearly has that whole Trumpist Western decline thing going on, and a fetish for the traditional less liberal East. He also, you may or not, you may or may not be surprised to learn, is something of a conspiracy theorist. He thinks COVID was real, but the response he tells me was draconian and unnecessary, and for ulterior motives. Let's just say that none of this is to my taste. Neither, though, does any of it seem to cross the line into actual hate speech, racist or otherwise. Not least because Tate himself is mixed race, and his fan base seems to include huge numbers of young Muslim men. He even has a habit of dropping words like haram into conversation, particularly when describing female behaviour he's not keen on. So whatever you think of him, I think it's important to know what his transgression actually was. There are rappers on Instagram and on social media today who have criminal charges against women, says Tate. You can find top 10 artists in the UK, drill artists who have fucking killed people, and they're singing about doing it again. I'm not sure this last bit is strictly true, but you take the point. You can certainly find gangster films on Netflix. Is it right to worry less about teenage boys watching them? As the artist Laura Dodsworth, a rare Tate defender, pointed out on Talk TV the other week, the same boys that this is supposedly all for can very easily pop over to Pornhub any day of the week and see far, far worse. 
So why this one? Why him? Perhaps you don't care. On a personal level, frankly, nor do I. We had a good chat, Tate and I, but the guy gives me the horrors. Not all the time, but enough of the time, I simply hate what he thinks. If I had a son, I'd hate the thought of him being exposed to it. And I'm far from wild about my daughters having to deal with teenage boys who have soaked in it. I even agonised about whether I ought to do this interview. Although if the most Googled man on the planet can't be written about in a newspaper, then I'm honestly not sure what any of us are here for. When we look back on the evolution of speech norms in the internet age, I do feel this case will have been an important one. What fascinates me about Tate is how neatly he sits on the fault line of this whole debate. Defending him makes me feel intensely uncomfortable, all dirty and complicit. Socially, professionally, perhaps even morally, it would be so much easier to delight in his downfall. I have to recognise the power of that. Yet I'm f also far from convinced he's been treated fairly. He's not a niche troll or a political hate monger. He's an entertainer who gives a sizable constituency precisely what they want. And yes, that's horrid, but so what? We talk of these things today in terms of influence and radicalisation. But is that dynamic really anything new? Maybe he's just a video nasty. Maybe he's just a punk. What Tate really is, I suppose, is a lesson in the sheer uncurated chaos of the influencer economy. A study in who makes it big and why. And even social media is changing. Before his ban, Tate had 4 million followers on Instagram, which sounds like a lot, but isn't. Cristiano Ronaldo had 400 times as many, and Kylie Jenner not far off the same. Neither of them, though, was the most Google person in the world. Where Tate thrived was in video, chiefly YouTube and TikTok. It's the new frontier, and it's where your kids spend their online lives. A regulator seems as lost as you or me. Banned or not, his content remains all over them. Like I said, it's a virus. The day after his ban, at any rate, Tate posted a new video on a lesser-known platform in which he promised to do things differently. This is a chance to move my social media purely to my charitable acts, even if my Instagram is reinstated, he said contrite. There'll be no pictures of Bugattis anymore. Sorry, gentlemen. Since then, though he's posted seven or eight more, hypocrisy, and they're exactly as they always were. You'll see that if you Google him, but don't. An interesting interview, balanced also, that allows you to understand more about Andrew Tate, both in two respects. First, identifying the various narcissistic indicators of what he is, but also going some way to explain his appeal and the reach that he has. I'll be continuing this with further information that's been provided from the Times to understand more about his reach and why he's able to get to people, notwithstanding what he is, join me there.